I'd like to introduce Peter Addy. Peter is a leading expert on salvia divinorum. He's investigating the behavioral effects of salvinorin A in healthy human subjects, as well as working with the NGO Scapastora in documenting indigenous uses of the plants. Peter Addy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I um, currently live in Portland, Oregon, and I do work with the School of Medicine in New Haven, Connecticut. Questions. I didn't get it. Um, so Salvia divinorum is a plant from southern Mexico. It's been used by indigenous people uh, for hundreds of years who's developed a sacred intentional relationship with, the, with this plant and the spirits related to it. Uh, I'd love to tell you more about the Mazatec people, but... Uh, there's a talk that I gave at Horizons 2014 where I, met, where I discussed the Mazatec. That's available online. And uh, later today, Stanley Krippner is going to give a talk about Salvador Roquette, who was in turn a therapist who worked with the Mazatec. And then uh, later on this weekend, Ben Feinberg is giving a talk devoted entirely to Mazatec shamanism. So I encourage you all to learn more about where this plant came from. The leaves of Salvia divinorum contain at least 20 unique chemicals. The most prevalent one is Salvinorin A. In 2002, this is the landmark study that really opened the door to all Salvia research. So Roth et al. 2002 dis determined in vitro that Salvinorin A is a potent selective kappa opioid receptor agonist. So to break that title down a little bit, Salvinorin A is potent. You can have a full psychedelic dose at about 1,000 micrograms. In contrast, that's about 20 times more potent than psilocybin. It's the most potent naturally occurring psychedelic substance we know of. And it is selective to the kappa opioid receptor. Uh, this is from the same paper, and we see that... Uh, uh, Roth et al. took about 50 different cloned human receptors and transporters. Salvinorin A, kind of greenish yellow at the top, it binds only to the kappa opioid receptor. In contrast, LSD is in red, and that binds to about 20 different receptors and transporters, mostly serotonin. So we can see that uh, they work, and LSD does not alter the kappa opioid receptor in any way. So these are working by completely unique pathways. And then most recently, just last year, we published research showing this in humans, that humans given an opioid blocker, naloxone, and then given salvia, have no effects, or very little effects. Whereas humans given catanserin, which is a serotonin blocker, and then salvia have a full uh, psychedelic salvia experience. So we've demonstrated finally in humans, it is a selective and potent kappa opioid receptor agonist. What does that mean? Oh, so it's also safe. So it has a low abuse potential, and it can be safely administered. Uh, the, the grand total of all human subjects research, we have 112 unique subjects from six labs in three countries, and we've reported a total of zero adverse events. So in the, in the rather structured limiting clinical settings that we, that we use here, it's, uh, it's a rather safe drug. So it's a kappa agonist. Most research on the opioid receptor system uh, involves mu or delta opioid receptors. And so they have uh, their endogenous endorphins and enkephalins that our own bodies make. There's also been some research, although not as much, using synthetic kappa agonists and antagonists and our, our body's own dynorphins, which are the, the naturally occurring peptides. And in rodents, and humans and in vitro lab studies, we see reliably that endorphins and enkephalins increase dopamine in the brain reward system called the basal ganglia. And this leads to euphoria. It feels very good. And it has uh, reinforcing and abuse potential. Our bodies release dynorphins, the kappa agonists, uh, in response to stress, pain, and drugs of abuse. And we, and we see that Kappa agonists, including salvinorin A, reduce dopamine in the basal ganglia, the reward circuitry. So it has an opposite effect as something like cocaine or morphine that increases dopamine. It's pretty, pretty reliable. 
that we see that synthetic COPPA agonists decrease dopamine in the, in the reward circuitry. Salvin RNA, the only known um, naturally occurring COPPA agonists, most of the time we see that same thing. So certain parts of the brain reward circuitry are called the caudate putamen and the dorsal striatum. Salvin RNA decreases dopamine concentrations most of the time, but not always. It seems to decrease dopamine in the nucleus accumbens as well. There's been one study where it increased dopamine levels and one study where it had no effect whatsoever. Um, and no one's really sure why. It might be differences in species and the tests used. There are different parts of the nucleus accumbens, but no one's really sure. But generally speaking, the story is that salvin RNA as a COPPA agonist reduces dopamine. And this, this has a lot of uh, potential use. For instance, you take something like cocaine. You take cocaine, and that immediately increases dopamine in the, in the brain reward circuits, which feels very good. But then, a few hours later, your body produces dynorphins and increases kappa agonism, which leads to decreases in dopamine and uh, feelings of dysphoria and anhedonia. And this is because our bodies crave homeostasis. So you take cocaine and your body goes, wow, this feels great. And then a few hours later, your body says, well, hold, hold on a second. Maybe, maybe we don't want to feel so great. Let's, let's bring this down a little bit because we're always seeking equilibrium. And so the COPPA system is essential to maintaining this kind of equilibrium. Uh, sometimes you take, if you give an animal salvin RNA who, and then cocaine, it, it um, stops them from seeking more cocaine or it reduces cocaine-related behaviors like um, hyperactivity in particular um, uh, nervous behavior that, that animals exhibit. And this has been shown mostly in rodents, sometimes non-human primates, no human research uh, at this point. But we see that probably salvin RNA and synthetic COPPA agonists reduce uh, substance use disorders or addictive uh, behaviors, at least in animals. Similarly, um, synthetic agonists uh, and antagonists have been researched for depressive or antidepressive effects, again, mostly in animals. And the literature isn't quite as consistent for depression. We see that most of the time, synthetic agonists and salvin RNA increase depressive or anxious responses to stress. But at least uh, sometimes, there's a minority of studies where they show that COPPA agonists increase a pro-depressive, or um, sorry, an antidepressive or an anti-anxiety response to stress. So again, part of this could be the species or the method of um, administration. We're also looking at a lot of differences between acute and chronic stress paradigms and the fact that a human who is depressed is different from a rodent who was subjected to a stress paradigm. So they're, they're kind of, so it doesn't really surprise me that the literature is less clear here, but what I'm interested in as a psychologist is humans, not so much rodents. So in humans, we, have, we see that synthetic COPPA agonists, for sure, without a doubt, lead to dysphoria and anhedonia in acute uh, research models. But um, we had these very interesting reports by Dr. Carl Haynes. He wrote some case series where he, uh, he was seeing patients with chronic treatment-resistant depression in Australia, and uh, he reported some of his patients would take small doses of salvia twice a week, and they had a complete remission in their depression. So this was the first uh, writing to suggest antidepressant or any kind of clinical potential for salvia in humans. Uh, these reports came out in 2001 and 2003, and wouldn't you know it, in 2002, Australia became the very first country to outlaw salvia use or, or possession, so no more case series from Australia. That's legislation for you. Um, more recently, uh, we've, uh, very interesting research came out that older antidepressants called tricyclics, so like uh, amitriptyline, amipramine, these sorts of things, these are antidepressants that used to be the number one antidepressant around. It was the only one. And those also are COPPA opioid agonists. So we see in humans that maybe COPPA agonism has antidepressant effects. I think 
that getting a little more speculative, I think that some of the reason for the, the differences between animals and humans and some of the differences between uh, low, low occasional doses and high acute doses and that sort of thing might be related to interoception, a word which here means integrating body-relevant signals with external stimuli to affect motivated behavior. What that means <laughs> is that all the, all the time, our body is sending hundreds of signals up to our brain from our skin, our organs, um, our lungs and hearts. Everything is sending signals up into our brain. And that gives us a sense of our body at present. At the same time, there are signals coming from the top down about the environment around us and our emotional reactions and responses to the environment and how we predict uh, pleasure or pain that might happen in the future. So we have bottom-up signals about our body in the present, and we have top-down signals about our emotional response to our body and our environment. Those signals all come together into the insular cortex, which is uh, right next to and strongly connected with the reward circuitry that I was mentioning earlier. And it just so happens that the insular cortex has one of the highest concentrations of kappa opioid receptors in the entire brain. And relatively low concentrations of mu and delta opioid receptors. So I would say that probably someone who takes salvia is going to um, interfere with insular cortex processing. It also turns out that interoception is disrupted in depression and addiction. So a hallmark of depression is a dysfunction of allesthesia. That's a word which here means the notion that whether or not a stimulus is rewarding or punishing depends on the internal state of the individual. So for instance, we, we see in animals, as well as humans, this isn't specific to, to human consciousness in any way, if you, you have this uh, post-cocaine increase in dynorphin expression, which leads to anhedonia and dysphoria, right? Sometimes that acts as a punisher. You know, I took cocaine, now I feel bad. I don't want to do cocaine anymore because I don't want to feel bad again. But other times, same animals in the same paradigm, uh, that acts as a reinforcer, that you're more likely to use cocaine again. Because I took cocaine, I felt good. Now I feel bad, I want to feel good again, so I'm going to take more cocaine. So it's the exact same stimulus, but it leads to two different responses. And that's because of differences in allesthesia and interoception. So in depression, uh, this kind of allesthesia dysfunction is that, uh, so if I'm not depressed, for instance, I don't notice that my heart is beating very often. Or if I do notice it, I, it's, I don't have a particular emotional response, it's just my heart's beating. That's what hearts do, hopefully. But if, I, if I'm clinically depressed, then I'm more likely to notice my heart beating than if I'm not depressed. And I'm more likely to attach uh, negative emotional significance to that heartbeat. I think that my heart is beating rapidly because everyone is staring at me and judging me. Or if I'm prone to an anxiety disorder, I might think my heart is beating because I'm about to have a heart attack and I need to go to the hospital. So it's the same signal, but the way that we consciously notice it and emotionally respond to that signal is altered in depression. Same thing with addiction, where we have uh, not only alterations in how our bodies perceive signals, but alterations in how the environment responds to our bodies. And this is, again, in animals as well as humans. We see that, for instance, if you show someone who is, if you show a recovering cocaine addict a rolled up dollar bill, they have a measurable physiological response. Someone who's never used cocaine before, you show them a rolled up dollar bill, no response, because like, it's just a dollar bill, who cares? So we have environmental cues that trigger uh, physiological addiction-related responses in the body. And the other way, if you as an animal or a human, if you're used to taking a drug in the same environment every time, your body starts to develop a tolerance. But if you use the same amount of drug in a novel setting, your tolerance is lower. You have more of a, a response to that drug, and that, can, that uh, leads to um, an increased likelihood of overdose when you're in an un unfamiliar environment. So we see that the same sort of thing, that the way that we understand, consciously understand and emotionally respond to our bodies and perceived pleasure or pain in our environment and in the future is changed or altered 
during addiction and depression. And wouldn't you know it, uh, we just recently were able to demonstrate in humans that salvin RNA alters interoception and allesthesia. This is also particularly interesting to me because as far as I know, this is the only demonstrated biphasic effect, which means that a low dose does one thing, but a high dose does something else. So in humans, we are able to show that a high dose of salvin RNA decreases subjects' um, trust that they have in their bodies and the signals coming from their bodies. Whereas a low dose or a medium dose of salvin RNA increases the ability for us to trust our bodies. High doses reduce our ability to understand or, or regulate the kinds of emotional responses that we feel in our bodies and, our, and the awareness of what those emotions are. So from other, from other research with other you know, non-drug conditions, we know that this kind of attention regulation and emotional awareness, increasing those things is related to antidepressant effects in psychotherapy trials. So a low dose of salvia has similar antidepressant effects on interoception as psychotherapy does. So you put it all together and we say that a probably, so that we say that probably salvin RNA reduces dopamine levels in the reward circuitry and it probably alters interoception. How, <laughs> uh, yeah, how, um, how exactly Salvin RNA is related to these things in acute you know, clinical trials versus real-world therapy conditions, how it's different between humans versus rats and mice. These are all unanswered questions, but I hope that we'll be able to explore them later. Uh, so to kind of summarize, there's a plant called Salvia divinorum. It contains Salvin RNA, which is a potent kappa agonist, which we haven't researched very well, but probably there's some typos on that slide. So there, so there are, um, so it has these effects on dopamine, reward, depression that we still need to tease out. Um, to finish, I just, I kind of, you know, really went through that quickly because I want to mention a story. So I started this research in 2007, just across the bay in Palo Alto, and I wanted to study what it's like for people when they take salvia. Also, in 2007, mere months after I started, a bill was proposed at the state level to outlaw salvia, to make it illegal in California, Schedule One controlled substance. So I wrote to my representatives. I contacted my representatives, the author of the bill, everyone who was on the public safety committee who was in charge of understanding this bill. And I called them multiple times. I sent them letters, like actual you know, paper, letters. I sent them the actual scientific articles. I said, don't take my word for it. Read the results yourself. And so I, uh, Daniel Siebert, who's one of the world's leading salvia experts, also in California, uh, a member from uh, the Arrowhead team, we all uh, are listed as three public, you know, private citizens who uh, were against this bill. And wouldn't you know it, the bill failed. It did not pass. <laughs> so... The following year, 2008, the, the author of the bill wrote a different bill that just made it illegal to sell to children, and that did pass. So in, as far as I know, in California, if you're an adult, you're able to buy and use salvia, but children are not. And I mention this because it's useful and important and a requirement for us to be engaged in local and state politics. So um, this assemblyman wanted to use politics to regulate and control science, and so I used science in order to influence politics, and it worked. And so I suggest to everyone here that this is a useful thing that we need to keep doing. Uh, I went through that a little faster than I thought, so I guess we have plenty of time for questions. I don't know if they're, we're going with the mics, I think. Yeah, so there's a, a mic in the aisle there. Can I use it? Um, I'll hold on to it. Oh, okay. Uh, in your last slide, you talked about low, medium, and high doses. Can you give us an idea what those are? Uh, if I remember right, uh, so I remember a high dose is one, one milligram or 1,000 micrograms. 
if I remember right, the medium dose was half that, 500 micrograms, but um, I, I could be wrong about that. But these are, so here's the reference, uh, Makeda et al, 2016. Uh, this was uh, Jordi Riva's lab in Spain. Hi, uh, my name is May Salvi. Okay. I just wanted to clarify, I'm assuming we're talking about um, inhalational salvia. Uh, can you speak to any research that's been done with oral forms or oh, any yeah. other routes of, uh, yeah. Yeah, excellent point. So everything here, everything that I was just talking about was using either um, inhaled purified salvin RNA, vaporized, or smoked concentrated salvia divinorum extract. There were two studies that used, um, that tried different preparations. So the very first one, Daniel Siebert, 1994, I think, um, he tried a whole bunch of different things. He tried pills and um, spraying in the oral mucosal membrane and all sorts of things. And he was able to get uh, some effect. And then John Mendelson at UCSF in, I think, 2010, he tried a sublingual route and had no effects whatsoever. He wasn't able to get anything out of it. So, and we know that salvin RNA is not absorbed in the stomach or the intestines whatsoever. It's absorbed in the, in the lungs very well and also the lining in your mouth. So smoking is going to work or traditionally the Mazatec people kind of chew the leaves and keep them, keep it in their cheeks, sort of like a chewing tobacco or that sort of thing. So drinking it or eating it is not going to have any effect. And so most of the research has been with vaporizing a pure compound. Uh -huh. And I don't know if you're willing to speak to some of the experiential um, data that's been received or what participants are endorsing, but uh, I was talking to Stan the other day about the concept of beings in certain psychedelic plants and certain plant medicines that a being appears. I, I, I personally believe that and have experienced that to be um, the case with uh, specifically salvia on the sublingual route or the oral, oral route. And I'm wondering if, um, I don't know, traditionally in the culture, I know there's other lectures this weekend, but um, kind of what, is there a religion based around it? Is this kind of like uh, a well-identified phenomenon or not all participants experience this or it's based on the dose or the frequency of use and kind of any insights on that? Thank yeah, you. there are a lot of factors involved for sure. I'd say, I know that um, the... The, studies that I, the study that I was personally uh, the, the investigator of, I don't remember people. There, were, there was a little bit of people talking about beings and, and going to other places where there were other residents of those places, but it was the minority. Uh, traditionally, this plant is considered the physical embodiment of the Virgin Mary. And so it's a feminine uh, plant ally, and you, you can speak through Mary and then uh, St. Peter, who, is, who guards the gates of heaven in order to have your prayers uh, heard and intercessed on. This is, of course, a um, syncretic religion. After, you know, after the Spanish conquest, everyone had to adopt, at least nominally, Catholic uh, iconography to continue their rituals. So whatever deities or names are associated with this plant pre-conquest, we've lost it. They didn't have a written language or they didn't have writing at the time, so we just we don't know what this what this plant used to be called. We don't know any of the prayers or anything. It's all been kind of absorbed into a folk Catholicism now. Hi, I'm oh, I'm uh, Daniel Reiskamp. Uh, so I was recently just happened to stumble across an article uh, in the Journal of Neuroscience that um, highlighted a potential. Uh, new therapeutic uh, approach for uh, kappa opioid receptor agonists, uh, including salvin RNA. Basically, they, uh, I haven't read the article yet, but they found that uh, kappa opioid receptor agonism uh, could pr take oligodendrocyte precursor cells and promote their differentiation into oligodendrocytes and to promote myelination. So I was wondering if uh, you've come across anything where there's therapeutic potential for salvin RNA or other kappa opioid receptor agonists in the treatment of uh, multiple scler sclerosis? No, I haven't come across that. I know that, so I, as a psychologist, I, I'm focusing on like psychiatric conditions, but there's also a lot of interest in how kappa agonists affect um, smooth muscle mm -hmm. fiber, um, but I, I, I haven't seen that. I'd like to see that reference. I haven't come across it. Yeah. I'm curious about um, your use of the term trusting and experiencing one's body as a phenomenon of the low dose 
versus at the higher dose, I mean, isn't there an issue here of awareness? Or are you saying at the higher dose that there would be less awareness or perhaps not any awareness at all of the body versus on a low dose there is? I mean, what's, what's the term trusting? How does that come in? Is that something that you were measuring specifically? Uh, yes, so we used uh, an, a new instrument called um, Maya, the, let's see, the multi-dimensional assessment of interoceptive awareness. And that is an eight, that, uh, so it's a questionnaire that you take and that leads to eight factors. One of those is called trusting. And it's, it's seen as that the signals that are coming from your body are trustworthy. So for instance, someone with body dysmorphic disorder or anorexia, they get signals from their body, but they don't trust those signals. Uh, a high dose of salvia, you probably have fewer signals to begin with, and what signals you do have, you don't trust. To press the point, what do you mean by you don't trust them? What does that okay. actually mean? Uh, so one of the subjects in my, in my study where we didn't use this assessment, it hadn't been invented yet, but one of my subjects uh, was in a recliner, and they said, you know, I, I advised them to close their eyes and lay back, put their feet up, and they said to me, I feel like I'm rocking or I'm kind of listing to one side. My left arm and leg are floating and my right arm and leg are extremely heavy. I open my eyes and I see that everything is level, but I close my eyes and I feel as if things are different. So they had a signal from their body and they didn't trust that signal. Hello. Uh, this is something that I've seen vaguely acknowledged, but not really discussed in any detail. And I just wonder if you could comment on it briefly. Um, but just how study of Salvinor and AS effects on the brain might hold therapeutic potential for Alzheimer's. I've seen some early references to that from uh, you know about ten years ago, but it was just it's uh, theoretical, and I don't uh, know too much about it to be honest. Hi. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I've been involved in the Mazatec tradition for many, many years and traveled there and studied with people. And, um, and it's my understanding from my teacher and the Mazatec people I work with there that salvia divinorum should never be smoked, that it is an insult to the plant to put it in a fire because it's connected with water and with the earth. And so I just wanted to make that comment. I understand the study, and I really appreciate your work, that the study here has to do with uh, material that can be measured. But I just wanted to talk about the, the roots of that plant and its usage, and uh, being called scapastora, you know, the leaf of the shepherdess, it has to do with the, with the earth and water and mother, and it should not be connected with fire. In a yeah, that's, sense. yeah, thank you for that comment. So it's not smoked traditionally. That's considered... Uh, rude, at least, or a sacrilege. And it is uh, the one of the names for the plant is Shka Pastor, which means the leaves of the shepherdess. And uh, the concept of a shepherdess or herding sheep is, again, a post-conquest introduction to Mexican culture. So the, these sorts of names and traditions, we just don't know what they used to be. But um, there's no evidence of, of anyone ever smoking salvia pre or post-conquest. I'll just speak to my two experiences of using salvia in its smoke form. As a, when I speak as a Shaktipat Kundalini Yogi, when I ingest plant substances, which are forms of plant Shaktipat, um, I went totally unconscious, and my consciousness regained without any of the five organs of sense. My total awareness was there, and I was in space. I had no idea where I was. Um, the most vivid thing was the sense of of sight shutting down in stages. So as I moved my head, I saw individual pictures and in total darkness. Yeah, that's, that's very common in, in higher doses. You can have an, a complete dissociative state where instead of reduced body signals, you have none whatsoever. So that, that's a very common thing that I've gotten from my participants and from other people uh, that I've heard you know, at conferences and things like that. Uh, what's, what's your question? I just, I just really did my experience um, to find out what, it, this, what I went through. This okay. is for questions, but um, okay. perhaps you could share later if that's okay. all right with you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, defi I'm definitely around to um, you know, the rest of the conference to talk to people. I, 
Uh, one of my mentor, uh, Jim Fadiman, he sometimes likes to say, you know, now it's time for questions. And a question is a sentence, and your voice goes up at the end. <laughs> In my experience of salvia, I also had a leaving of my body, and I was introduced by... So I agree, it's different when it's inhaled and when it's ingested. And to give, like, more context to the loss of body sensation... Um, I was personally immediately greeted by beings who then took me into a tube and then my body became the tube. So uh, for me, it was a sense of spirit being able to move into what otherwise people think are inanimate objects, mm -hmm. and it made me an animist. <clears throat> so now I believe in their beings. But um, I found it interesting. It's been a while since medical school. I don't remember the insular cortex's like, exact relationship to the vagus nerve. But do you have any thought as to, like the vagus nerve is the longest nerve in the body. I mean, when you talk about yoga and pranayama, that's the nerve that we're affecting. When we slow it down, we get nauseated, vomit. What is the connection? Maybe there, maybe there's something to be explored there. I, I don't know if you. Yeah, I don't. Um, I can't remember right now. You know, the physical connections between the two, but I know that a lot of the work, that's a lot of the research on interoceptive ability, is looking at things like breath control and noticing heart rate and the. This um, MAIA scale that we use, this was normed uh, in clinical populations, people with chronic low back pain and depression and things like that. But it was also normed in healthy people who engage in mindfulness and mind-body practices like yoga and tai chi. So you're, you're doing a practice which gives you greater control or, or um, understanding of your vagus nerve, and then you score a certain way on this measure, such as by increasing attention, regulation, and emotional awareness. So how are those two things physically connected? I, I don't remember. But certainly in a clinical sense, they're, they're connected for sure. Thank you so much. Mm. There's clearly a lot of interest in this topic, and I mm. hope you'll stay around for a few minutes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.